Welcome to Phyllis Diller's Marriage Manual. Uh, forward. Do you have a marriage that is constantly in the repair shop? Do you have the feeling that even Maury Wills wouldn't steal home if it was like yours? Was the last time you smiled for your <laughs> wedding photograph? Since marriage is a private institution and not supported by public funds, I want to help. You may think you know all the rules you need to, like no rabbit punches and no kidney blows, but I have some, some, I have some other suggestions that will make till death to us part seem, not, seem like not quite so long. First and foremost, get married with a feeling it is going to last, not like the bride I knew who doubled the wedding cake recipe and froze one. Sometimes I think brides and wives have a tendency to forget that husbands are people. We all know that happiness in marriage depends on how well the husband's minds, minds, how well the husband minds, <laughs> but there are subtle underhanded methods of getting across to him the fact that the wedding bell is not the liberty bell. Many marriage experts say, quote, live in the present, don't anticipate what might happen. I cannot go along with this. If you have a marriage like mine, you'll be happier worrying about the future. This book deals with the reality and teaches the kinds of truths not available in other so-called marriage manuals. Chapter 1. I met him through a broken IBM machine. Explores the terrible problem of knowing what kind of man you have chosen. This information can save you from making the awful mistake that I made. When we married, Fang was so far over the hill, he got more excited over a filled prescription than a filled sweater. Really, it's too much when your husband insists that you toast his Zweibeck. Chapter 2, Misery Loves Company, contains intimate romance and sex instructions. Remember, beauty isn't everything, and sometimes the most handsome men make the worst husbands, and vice versa. One of my friends, who is happily married, has a husband so ugly, she met him when her friend sent her... <laughs> she met him when a friend sent him over to her house to cure her hiccups. Whatever you may look like, it is wise to marry a man your own age. As your beauty fades, so will his eyesight. Chapter 3. Marriage on the Rocks. This deals with the maintenance of domestic tranquility. You will learn that the proper thing to say if your husband comes in unexpectedly while you're describing him to the kids is an experts agree <laughs> and experts agree stupid lazy drunken men make the best fathers. You will also learn that you shouldn't be one of those women who hu whose husbands outgrow them. Read a lot. Take courses at night school. I have a friend who can say, shut up, you bum, in seven languages. This chapter also warns against trying to interpret everything your husband says because you may miss some wonderful insults along the way. An example of this is when Fang said, I'll take some of that fab gravy. I thought he meant fabulous, but weeks later <laughs> he told me it meant it tasted like soap. That's a joke for only people born in the 70s. Let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you a discussion that starts, I'll tell you something you do that irritates me if you tell me something I do that bothers you never ends in a hug and a kiss. Chapter four, the power behind the throne instructs on the nature of man, laziness. It offers the consolation that unless you're married to Henry VIII, you're more likely to outlive your, your husband. Your husband realizes this, and by being lazy, he may be thoughtfully preparing you for widowhood. Of course, Fang isn't lazy. He's just professionally unemployed. I don't mean to say that Fang changes jobs, but he, but he could have been on the what's my line every week since the program started. If your husband gets fired as often Fang, I will pass on, fired as often as Fang, I will pass on this important tip. When he calls and says he's bringing the boss home to dinner, don't, <laughs> don't start getting it ready until 5.30. Chapter 5. My mother-in-law wears army shoes, 
reveals how to live with the disgusting fact that, as a group, mother-in-law are the longest-lived obsolete species in the world. Chapter 6, His Car Has More Insurance Than I Do, teaches how to call a bail bond. <laughs> teaches how to call a bail bondsman, explain why the rear bumper is in the back seat, and what not to say to a wise guy policeman. In the, append in the appendices at the back of the book, I have tried to deal with such certain unexplored aspects of wedding etiquette, such as, number one, before you get married, you should meet your fiancé's parents. It is, not, it is not enough that you like his parole officer. Number two, when the bridal consultant says you should have traditional wedding music, it does not necessarily mean what has been played at your four previous weddings. Number three, when in a wedding line, don't say to the <laughs> don't say to the bride and groom, "I just hope you'll be as happy as we thought we'd be." Finally, I have provided a happy marriage test, which is certain to clear up any remaining problems. Perhaps the greatest lesson I've learned is that self-pity is better than none. This being the case, it is, is it any wonder I decided to write a marriage manual? Signed, Phyllis Diller. So there you go for all you people quarantining with other people. I'll be here for the next week or so with some marriage advice from Phyllis Diller.